Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's Trademark and Copyright Webinar, the 2017 Trademark and Copyright Year in Review. My name is Kristen McCallion, and I'm a principal in the New York office of Fish and Richardson and chair of the firm's copyright group. And today I'll be presenting with my colleagues, Manu Harnell, who's an associate here with me in New York, and Nancy Lee, an associate in our San Diego office. For those of you who are interested, our bios are available in the handout section of the webinar widget. You can see it on the bottom of your screen. And for those of you in New York and New Jersey, please complete the CLE sheet that is also available in the handout section. Today's webinar will run for about an hour and includes a Q&A period at the end of the program. You may ask questions though at any time. Um, you can do that throughout the program by clicking the questions section on the widget on, on your screen to submit your question. We'll see it and we will do our best to answer them in real time, time permitting. And if we can't do them in real time, we'll do them at the end. Um, and if we don't get to them, we can always chat offline after the webinar. Feel free to contact us personally by phone or email, and that's easier. Uh, let's go to the next. Oh, so here you can see uh, the link to the Fish and Richardson website where the webinar material is. Um, so starting off with our agenda, uh, this is pretty straightforward and simple today. We're going to talk about notable trademark cases, notable copyright cases, and then also cases to watch for in 2018. Before we get started with the substance, I just want to remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of FISH or its clients, and it's also not intended to address every court or case situation. We would need many, many hours to do that. So let's start off. Let's go to the next slide. We're gonna start off with trademark cases. There have been many, many, many interesting trademark decisions this year. Um, we're going to talk about a handful of them. We're going to start off today with a case Fish has been watching for many years. Uh, this case was formerly known as In Ray Tam and Levy Tam. I, uh, there's been a long history here, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the facts. Uh, Fish has spoken about this in prior webinars. You've blogged about it as well. But as many of you probably know and recall, I'm going to give a little bit of a background just as a refresher. The TAM case involved the PTO's refusal to register the mark The Slants, which was used as the name for an Asian American dance rock band. Uh, the refusal to register was based on the notion that the mark was disparaging to people of Asian descent. So that happened in the PTO. It went up to the TTAB, which affirmed the refusal to register. That then went up to the Federal Circuit. There were a couple of Federal Circuit decisions. The first decision affirmed the PTO's refusal of registration. That affirmance was based on precedent that held that the refusal of registration did not stop the applicant from using the mark, just stopped the applicant from registering the mark, and therefore did not bar speech. But in this opinion, Judge Moore of the Federal Circuit was dissatisfied that the court was bound by this precedent and urged a rehearing on bank. That actually happened. And this is a few years ago. On the rehearing, the majority applied an unconstitutional condition analysis, holding that a federal trademark registration is an important federal benefit that cannot be denied. The court found that the content-based regulation of Section 2A could not be justified on the grounds of trademarks are commercial speech. A trademark is not commercial or government speech, but was instead found to be private speech. This is a really, really important holding of the case um, and essentially was a game changer for this case and many cases to come after it. Basically, the court held that the bar against registration did not seek to regulate the commercial function of the mark, but was instead a viewpoint-based regulation. When the government discriminates against speech because it disapproves of the message conveyed by the speech, it essentially is discriminating, discriminating on the basis of viewpoint, and that's what makes the statute unconstitutional. So after that happened, the PTO, of course, appealed to the Supreme Court. It had a very specific question in its petition for cert, 
which was whether the disparagement provision in Section 2A of the Lanham Act is facially in invalid under the Free Speech Clause of the First Amendment. On June 19th in 2017, the Supreme Court delivered its judgment in favor of Tam and his mark, the slant. It voted unanimously to affirm the Federal Circuit's opinion that found 2A as unconstitutional. The Supreme Court's opinion stated very clearly that the Disparagement Clause violates the First Amendment's Free Speech Clause. Contrary to the USPTO's contention, trademarks are private and not government speech. Note that the TAM case, while it involves Section 2A, it really only addressed a portion of it, i.e. the disparagement portion, but there's a lot more to 2A. In fact, Section 2A bars the registration of immoral, deceptive, and scandalous matter in addition to matter that might disparage. So, trademark lawyers like us wondered whether the ban on immoral, deceptive, or scandalous material would survive after the holdings in TAM. The writing was on the wall, we all thought, and the TAM case did in fact pave the way for others. Um, two, I'm gonna mention subsequent decisions that recently occurred on uh, December 15th, just a short time ago. The US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, again, struck down the Lanham Act ban, but this time it was on the other section of, other portion of section 2A that I just referenced, the section banning registration of immoral or scandalous material. It banned that section of uh, 2A as unconstitutional on a First Amendment grounds. In that case, the mark was F-U-C-T. I'm sure you can all sound that out, which the PTO had refused to register because it's a connotation as a curse word. In that case, and the name of the case is in Ray Brunetti, the applicant had sought registration in connection with clothing. So that one was just in December 15, but even later than that, just last week, the Redskins won in the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit vacated prior court decisions that had canceled the Redskins federal trademark registrations. I'm sure you're all familiar with those decisions as well. This recent Fourth Circuit decision effectively ended a legal fight that has been raging over the Redskins team name for nearly a generation. The decision did not turn on whether Redskins was disparaging or not. That question is largely irrelevant now, at least when it comes to federal registration. But because Section 2A is unconstitutional, the Redskins marks will continue to be registered. So, a lot of impact from In Ray Tam, um, all kind of circling around right now. And it will be interesting to see the effects of all of this. For example, will people be more prone to adopt disparaging and or scandalous marks because they can register them? Who knows? Perhaps this will be a topic we continue to discuss in our webinars in years to come. So I am going to turn it over now to Manu. We can hit the next slide, please. Who's going to discuss a few interesting generic decisions of this year? Thank you, Kristen. Um, as Prince has mentioned, we're going to switch gears over to generic uh, discussion of trademark. This particular case, Elliot v. Google, deals with generic side of a trademark, which is a concern for many trademark owners because it can lead to a loss of brand rights. Um, generic side typically occurs when the public understands the primary significance of a trademark as the generic name for a particular type of product or service, irrespective of its source. So, in this particular case, in 2012, the plaintiffs David Elliott and Chris Gillespie filed for cancellation of Google trademark in the Arizona District Court on the grounds that the word Google is primarily understood as a generic term used to describe the act of internet searching. Their position largely hung on the fact that widespread use of Google as a verb, often used in the context of I Google it or let's Google that, um, and that verb usage constitutes generic use as a matter of law. The district court did not agree and found that the Google <coughs> uh, trademark is not generic. The plaintiffs filed an appeal to the Ninth Circuit, which affirmed the district court decision, emphasizing that a claim of genericide is not made in the abstract, but must relate to a particular type of good or service, and that the usage of a trademark as a verb or noun does not necessarily constitute 
generic use because a trademark can serve a dual function. That is to name a product while at the same time indicating its source. The relevant inquiry here was not whether Google was being used for the act of searching um, as the plaintiffs put forth. Instead, the, uh, inquiry, the correct inquiry that the board applied was whether the primary significance of the word Google to consumers is a generic name uh, for internet search engines or as a mark identifying the Google search engine in particular. The court found that the evidence showed use of Google by the public, even as a verb, referred exclusively to Google's own search engine. So there was a clear indication of source here. Um, individuals in the public and large were not referring to any search engine, uh, any third party engines. Uh, referring to the phrase Google that was a clear indication of the Google services provided under the mark. So it was clear that there was a source indication. Um, in the end, the court relied he heavily on the uh, tie between the generic, uh, the use of the generic uh, of, of a trademark and a use of, uh, sorry, the use of a trademark in a generic sense does not alone support generic side of a trademark without tying it to any good or service. It also helped that Google worked diligently to provide an overwhelming amount of evidence um, in enforcing its mark and educating the public and correcting dic dictionary uh, entries so that they specifically refer the Google search engine versus just generic search engines, um, all of which helped maintain the rights in the trademark. Um, now, moving on to the next case, which is another issue, uh, case dealing with genericness, we have Booking.com versus Macau. This is a case that came started back in 2011 when Booking.com filed four applications for Booking.com uh, covering hotel services and travel agency services. Um, expectedly, the USPTO refused registration uh, initially because the mark was descriptive, but subsequently deeming it to be generic with respect to the services and in the alternative that it is descriptive and that there's not sufficient evidence of required distinctiveness. Um, Booking.com submitted a number of evidence to support its claim of required distinctiveness, including dictionary definitions, printouts, examples from news articles, um, declarations, press releases, none of which the, TT, um, the USPTO found persuasive. Ultimately, Booking.com appealed this to the TTAB, where the TTAB maintained the refusal and held that booking refers to a reservation or arrangement to buy a travel ticket or stay in a hotel room and the act of reserving such travel accommodation. And that the .com component of the mark simply indicates the commercial website, which does not negate the generic character of the term booking um, and the combined term booking.com would be understood by consumers primarily to refer to an online reservation service for travel tours and lodging. This did not sit well with booking.com and this was pushed further and they filed a civil action in the Eastern District of Virginia in 2016 uh, against the U U uh, PTO and the USPTO director challenging the denial of the registration. Um, interesting note here is that they could have also filed an appeal to the U uh, U.S. appeals for the federal circuit, but an appeal to the federal circuit is taken on the record before the USPTO, and the USPTO's factual findings will be upheld if they are supported by substantial evidence. So the federal circuit will review the TTAB's decisions regarding genericness and descriptiveness for substantial evidence. And generally that gives more of a deferential standard uh, than the de novo review that's applied under a civil action. Also, uh, one reason that they may not have pursued the uh, federal circuit is because there was already precedent in place that weighed against the mattress.com care. Interestingly to note is that the district court did not rely on the Federal Circuit precedent, although they acknowledged it uh, regarding the top level domains. Instead, the uh, court relied on a Federal Circuit ruling that dealt with telephone numbers, specifically 1888 mattress, uh, 
which was protectable, found protectable as a trademark. The reasoning was that the mattress component of the 188 number is descriptive. However, the area code 888 adds an element to the mark such that the mark as a whole is descriptive. Since this is a case of first impression and there's no precedent in the full circuit regarding source identifying significance of a top level domain, the district court agreed that booking is generic. However, found that the uh, top level domain .com added enough source identifying significance to make the mark as a whole merely descriptive. Um, from there, there has to be a showing of acquired distinctiveness, and that would be sufficient to allow registration. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, the court revisited the evidence that was submitted, found it sufficient to find uh, acquired distinctiveness for hotel services, though not travel agency services. Um, so currently, uh, Booking.com has gone back and one on partially one on uh, on their hotel services though they filed for a division of their application and uh, I believe they're still awaiting registration um, there's a possibility that this could be filed there could be a further appeal filed of the um, district court decision though we have to wait and see what occurs on that so the next case is Nancy, um, who will discuss barrel brewing. Thanks, Manu. So Kristen and Manu talked about some issues that you could face in trying to get a trademark registration, but another hurdle that you could face is if an application is blocked by a third-party registration. And this is exactly what happened to 10 Barrel Brewing. So 10 Barrel applied to register the mark Apocalypse IPA4, you guessed it, beer. And its application was blocked by a registration for the mark Apocalypse Brew Works for beer. And so the issue here was, so 10 Barrel had been using its IPA mark since 2009. However, it did not file an application to register its mark until 2014. But Apocalypse Brew Works mark was used later in 2012, but the Brew Works application was filed before the IPA mark, and that's why the Brew Works mark was cited against the IPA application. And the IPA applicant um, noted its priority in a response to an office action and asked the trademark office to suspend prosecution while it addressed the issue with the registrant. And so IPA did this by filing a petition to cancel the registration based on the priority. The parties resolved their differences and concluded that their respective uses of the IPA and Brewworks mark was unlikely to cause con consumer confusion. The parties entered into an initial consent agreement where Brewworks consented to the registration of the IPA application. And with this consent agreement in hand, IPA went back to the trademark examiner and asked her to withdraw the refusal. The consent agreement said that Brewworks would only use its mark in connection with beer and that the IPA mark would only be used in connection with beer. It also said that the parties agreed to comply with additional terms set forth in a separate coexistence agreement that was not attached to the consent agreement that was submitted to the PTO and that the parties would use reasonable efforts to avoid a likelihood of confusion. And under the rules, an applicant can submit a, co a consent agreement in an, an attempt to overcome a registration refusal where a third party mark is cited against the application. The examiner can give great weight to the agreement, but the party's judgment as to confusion does not outweigh the examiner's judgment with regard to confusion. So taking this to heart, the trademark examiner maintains her likelihood of confusion, a likelihood of confusion refusal, and found that the submitted consent agreement was a naked consent for two reasons. One, it did not give the reasons as to why the parties believed that there was no likelihood of confusion, and two, it did not describe the arrangement between the parties to avoid confusion. So naked consents are given little weight, but the examiner said that if IPA submitted a more closed consent agreement, then the refusal would be reconsidered. 
the examiner gave five factors to consider when weighing the consent agreement, which are shown on the slide. And with these words of wisdom, um, IPA submitted another consent agreement, this time saying that Brewworks only sells its beers in kegs, barrels, growlers, or on tap, whereas IPA only sells its beers in bottles, and that both parties sell their respective beers under different logos, which you see um, in those two images. The consent agreement also noted that there are geographical areas specified in the separate coexistence, which again was not um, attached to this consent agreement, and that Brewer, Brewworks would not use its mark um, as a primary brand outside those areas, but it never specified what those areas were. And IPA also shared that its beer is sold in um, bottles and cans in convenience stores, liquor stores, and grocery stores. So was this enough to overcome the refusal? Nope. The trademark examiner still did not think that the revised consent agreement clearly indicated that the goods traveled in separate trade channels or that the parties agreed to restrict their field of use. There was also no restriction in the application or registration with how the marks would appear when used on the goods. So now what? IPA is re appealing the refusal and it's in the briefing stage with the TTAB, so we need to stay tuned to see which way the barrel rolls. And taking a look at this case, there are a few things to just keep in mind. Um, one is to do a clearance search when you're coming up with a new trademark that you want to roll out with. Um, file early and also when you're running into an issue where you're going to be crafting a consent agreement, take into account these five consent agreement factors. And um, so with that in mind, um, next slide please, we are going to take a look at a case in where the parties were unable to work out their differences. And this is what happened between Trader Joe's and Michael Hallett, who was doing business as Pirate Joe's, and Pirate Joe's was formerly known as Transylvania Trading. And so the significance of this case centers around the extraterritorial reach of the Lanham Act. You see, Trader Joe's only has stores in the United States, but Canadian customers regularly travel across the border to shop at Trader Joe's stores in northern Washington. Mr. Hallett had a business where he would purchase Trader Joe's branded goods in Washington and transport the goods across the border to Canada and sell the products in a store designed to mimic a Trader Joe's store. Trader Joe's employees noticed that Mr. Hallett, who's a Canadian resident, would visit a Washington store about 25 miles from the Canadian border seven, several times a week and purchase large quantities of Trader Joe's products. When a an employee later learns that Mr. Hallett had a store in Canada that he named Pirate Joe's to sell Trader Joe's products. They asked him to stop. But, and, but Mr. Hallett refused to stop buying these products to resell. Trader Joe's even declined to sell um, and serve Mr. Pro to serve Mr. Hallett as a customer, but he was not easily deterred. He would wear disguises to shop at various Trader Joe's and drove as far as Portland, Seattle, and California to buy Trader Joe's products. So Trader Joe's sued Mr. Hallett in Washington federal court for trademark infringement and unfair competition under the Lanham Act, as well as other state law claims. Mr. Hallett successfully moved to dismiss Trader Joe's Lanham Act claims for a lack of summary uh, for subject matter jurisdiction, arguing that the Lanham Act did not apply to his conduct in Canada because he was selling the products in Canada. So Trader Joe's appealed and the Ninth Circuit held in this situation that the Lanham Act applied ter extraterritorially because Mr. Hallett's acts affected American foreign commerce and it caused injury to Trader Joe's under the Lanham Act. So looking at how it affected American commerce, Mr. Hallett so he purchased all his products from the United States and resold them in the Canadian store. And his activities also harmed Trader Joe's because it harmed Trader Joe's reputation and decreased the values of its trademark. For example, in the products that Mr. Hallett purchased, he would also purchase perishable items and apparently did not refrigerate the items when transporting them back to Canada because a customer became sick after eating a Trader Joe's branded product that she purchased from Pirate Joe's. 
And so the Ninth Circuit reversed the district court's dismissal of Trader Joe's Lanham Act claims, and the parties went back to district court and litigated throughout 2017. And it was at the end of the year last year that Trader Joe's voluntarily dismissed its suit at the end of the year. So now I'm going to turn it back to Kristen to discuss nominative fair use issues. Thanks, Nancy. We can move to the next slide, please. I think the biggest takeaway <clears throat> is uh, don't use the word pirate in your name when you are deciding to infringe someone else's mark. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about International Information Systems v. Security University. It's a nominative fair use case. We can move to the next slide. Excellent. Um, so as Nancy noted, this is a nominative fair use case. These types of cases don't come up all that often, but they always seem to be interesting nonetheless. I'll go into just a very brief description of the facts. Um, the plaintiff is called ISC, and it develops standards for information security industry and developed a certification program using a certification mark, which is CISSP. It's an acronym. The defendant was a security or is a, a university also in the business of security, information security, catering to the information security industry. The founder of the defendant was an individual who had in fact been certified uh, under the program developed by the plaintiff such that she could, she could say that she was CISSP certified. And the parties agreed in fact that there were, you know, uh, acknowledged and, and verified uses of this certification mark that were proper, non-infringing. Um, for example, what I just said, if you were certified under the program, you could in fact say, I am CISSP certified. The problem here though, was that the defendant was taking it a step too far. It was advertising its founder as a master CISSP or a CISSP master. And there was not in fact a master certification. So the plaintiff uh, alleged that it was improper use and confusing use of this certification mark. So a lawsuit commenced and the defendant brought up uh, the nominative fair use defense. Generally speaking, nominative fair use, it's a defense to a trademark infringement claim and it could be quite powerful because it allows a person to use the trademark of another as a reference to that trademark owner's goods or services. The doctrine was developed in the Ninth Circuit in a case that is now very well known involving new kids on the block. Essentially, the Ninth Circuit in that case developed a three-part test that looked to, generally speaking, how much of the mark was used, uh, was it just enough, was it too much, and was there an unlawful suggestion of sponsorship. Uh, that test, through the three-prong test of the Second Circuit, has been used in many, many cases over the years. Um, and in fact, over the years, different circuits developed different tests. And we can go to the next slide, which does show some of the different tests that have formed over the years in the Second Circuit, the Third Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit. Um, so what's interesting about this case is not only did it discuss the different tests, it also discussed whether the nominative fair use doctrine is an affirmative defense or if it's just a defense. This doesn't sound that important or exciting, but it could impact how the doctrine is evaluated in litigation. So what happened here was that this is a Second Circuit decision, and it made very a, a, a handful of very interesting holdings. Um, the Second Circuit first held that the district court erred. Um, it just it erred in considering only source confusion as the type of confusion that's relevant in this type of case. For example, it should have also considered confusion as to sponsorship, affiliation, or connection, which could be different than source confusion. So courts now in New York, in the Second Circuit, must evaluate all of the various types of confusion. The court also held that the district court erred in applying the Ninth Circuit's three-prong test. That's what you see up on the slide. It in fact said, that's not enough. 
you've got to do that test. You've got to go through the motions of that test as well as going through the Second Circuit's Polaroid test. Many, many, many factors. It also held that nominative fair use is not an affirmative defense to trademark infringement. It's a defense. So now, in the Second Circuit, in addition to considering the Polaroid factors, courts must consider three additional factors. Whether the use of the plaintiff's mark is necessary to describe both the plaintiff's product or service and the defendant's product or service. Whether the defendant uses only so much of the plaintiff's mark as necessary and whether the defendant did anything that would suggest sponsorship or endorsement by the plaintiff slash trademark owner. Um, so this is an interesting decision. The Supreme Court recently just declined to hear the case, despite the fact that there are now at least three different tests in three different circuits. Um, and we think this is kind of a big deal. It could very well make it more difficult now to rely on a nominative fair use defense, at least in the Second Circuit. The test is quite comprehensive and now involves many, many factors. So we can move forward now. We can move to the next slide, perfect. We are going to now touch upon a handful of very important copyright decisions this year. The first one we're gonna talk about is Star Athletica. I'm sure this case has been on many people's radar. Um, we followed this case over the last few years very closely, as I'm sure many of you did, and involves the concept of separability in copyright law, which has always been a bit of a bear to analyze. Um, the circuits analyze the concept differently, and they all analyze the co concept differently from the Copyright Office, uh, adding to the confusion over how exactly to figure out whether something is separable. So let me back up a little bit and talk about what separability is. In the Copyright Act, to be protectable, a feature of a useful article must be physically or conceptually separable. The concept of separability was born from Section 101 of the Copyright Act. That's where all of the definitions are provided. Um, Section 101 makes pictorial, graphic, or sculptural features of the design of a useful article eligible for copyright protection if they can be identified separately from and are capable of existing independently of the utilitarian aspects of the article. Makes perfect sense, right? Very straightforward. <laughs> well, not so much. Um, Varsity Brands uh, had more than 200 copyright registrations for the two-dimensional designs you see up on the slide, consisting of lines, chevrons, shapes, um, graphical images, which it had registered, as I noted, and essentially they all appeared on the surface of cheerleading uniforms that Var Varsity Brands made and sold. Varsity Brands sued Star Athletica, who of course also markets and sells cheerleading uniforms. The basis of the claim was copyright infringement. At the district court level, the court granted Star Athletica, the defendant, summary judgment, holding that the des designs could not be conceptually or physically separated from the uniforms. The uniforms are not protectable in and of themselves because they're useful articles. Because the designs could not be separated from the useful article, copyright ownership was denied, the infringement claim was denied, no infringement. Well, there was an appeal, of course, and the Sixth Circuit came out quite differently. It found that the designs could be identified separately and were capable of existing independently of the uniforms. So it did find copyright protection. That again was appealed, this time to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court found that a feature of the design of a useful article is eligible for copyright if, when identified and imagined apart from the useful article, it would qualify as a pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work, either on its own or when fixed in some other tangible medium. Well, how do you, you know, how do you employ this test? How do you figure all this out? Um, the court said that in this respect, with the designs on the cheerleading uniforms, it was actually quite straightforward. First, one could identify the decorations as features having their own pictorial and graphic qualities just by looking at them. Um, second, the arrangement of the colors, the shapes, the stripes, the chevrons on the surface of the cheerleading uniforms. They could be separated from, a, from the uniform and applied in another medium. For example, those designs could be painted on a painter's canvas, in which case they would qualify 
as works of art. That seemed very straightforward to the Supreme Court. So now going forward, we have one test to determine conceptual separability. Um, hoping, as copyright practitioners all are, that this will make it easier to figure out when something is conceptually separable and thus affordable to uh, copyright protection and can be registered in the Copyright Office. I will run down the test for you. A feature incorporated into the design of a useful article is eligible for copyright protection only if the feature can be perceived as a two or three dimensional work of art separate from the useful article and would qualify as a protectable pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work either on its own or fixed in another medium of expression. Again, looking at the slide, you can see how these designs and the images and the shapes could com be composed on a, on a canvas um, in some other file where when taken away from the uniform, they would be works of art. And so the designs you see up on the slide were deemed protectable by the Supreme Court. So that's our conceptual separability test. We can move on to the next slide. Another interesting case, this one in the Second Circuit of New York, um, Graham v. Prince. This is a fair use case. Many of you might know Richard Prince. He's a well-known appropriation artist. He's been an artist for many decades. Um, and he's actually been the subject of prior copyright decisions in New York. In this case, the plaintiff is Donald Graham. He's a photographer. He brought suit against Prince for using a photograph of a Rastafarian that he had taken. The photograph was taken by Prince and used in Prince's 2014 exhibition titled New Portraits. Um, what you're seeing on the slide is fairly self-explanatory, but Graham's original photograph is on the left. Prince's appropriation of that photograph is on the right. The exhibition by Prince, as I said, it was titled New, Port New Portraits, but essentially it presented numerous prints that were made to appear as other people's Instagram posts with comments by Prince. If you can see the comments on the bottom uh, of the photograph, you can see that there are some actually there by Prince himself. So what happened was the artwork that you see was actually an Instagram post. This, this photograph was on Instagram, shared by Instagram users. Prince saw it and commented on it. Um, he submitted his own comment, took a screenshot of it, of it on his phone, and then put it on Canvas. He actually had a number of portraits that looked uh, like Instagram, as if they were Instagram images, and, and they were, in fact. Um, this image that you see, the Prince image, was used to promote the exhibit. It appeared on billboards, on marketing pieces, etc. You might recall Prince from a prior lawsuit that I think I actually talked about a couple years ago, which was Cariou v. Prince. A uh, similar situation, a photographer had sued Prince for copyright infringement for using, lo and behold, pictures of Rastafarians. In that case, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals found that 25 of the 30 images created by Prince were fair use of the original photographer's photographs, and thus were not infringing. Uh, there were five images remaining in that case and the party settled. But that set the stage, so to speak, and so hot off the success of that suit, Prince moved to dismiss the complaint in this suit, the one filed by Graham. Um, we can move to the next slide where you can see how that played out. And actually on the top right, kind of small, but these are images from the prior case filed by Cariou. Um, the You could see similar subject matter of Rastafarians depicted. Again, here, Prince's image is on the right. And what he had done in the prior case was he took the photographs and altered them and added color and added shapes and, and made them just look a little bit different, uh, which was a big, big part of the court's finding of fair use. And there's a quote here at the top from that prior case. Well, this is a motion to dismiss, as I noted a couple of minutes ago. Um, and it's hard on a motion to dismiss to, to win that, right? Because the court is constrained by the evidence it can review on that type of motion. So 
fair use is a mixed question of fact and law. Um, it's very highly fact specific, context sensitive, and requires evidence. And you could see the four fair use factors on the slide, purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, amount used, and the effect on the market for the original work. These four factors come out of section 107 of the Copyright Act, and the court did, did run through them. Um, the, the first factor includes a sub-factor, which basically looks to whether the second work is transformative. It's actually the heart of the fair use inquiry, even though it's not specifically referenced in factor one or in the statute, um, but it really does shape the opinion as to whether the alleged work is going to be found as fair use. The more transformative the work is, the more likely it will be found to be fair use. Um, in order for something to be transformative, the second work must add, you know, have added to it new expression, a new meaning, a new message. So that is a pivotal decision in a fair use analysis. But the court, you know, kept reflecting on the fact that this was a motion to dismiss. Um, it went through the fair use factors that had that the court reviewed in the prior Cariou case. Um, it discussed, you know, the fact that there wasn't a lot of evidence in this case because of the procedural posture. And essentially what the court found, it did go through the factors, but it found that at, at that motion, at that point in time, uh, Prince's artwork was not transformative as a matter of law. It also advised that it could not determine transformation conclusively uh, because that was up to a, a reasonable observer and the court is not necessarily a reasonable observer. The court also viewed Prince's artwork as likely to be commercial, um, going through the, the, the factors and the third one that it also deemed the plaintiff's photograph to be highly creative and copied. Um, if you look at the photographs, they look very similar and you can easily see how the first photograph was taken as a whole. It also discussed uh, the economic uh, portion of the work. Obviously, Prince is selling his artwork for lots of money. <laughs> and the market effects on the plaintiff, right? What were the market effects of Prince's use? Um, the court wasn't quite sure because it did not have all of the evidence it needed before it. So ultimately, Prince's motion to dismiss the case based on a fair use defense was denied. Uh, but this case is still going you know, through discovery, and it'll be interesting to see how all this pans out. Um, but as the evidence is produced by either side and fact discovery and closes, there is bound to be a summary judgment motion or even a settlement that results from the, the, uh, the denial of the motion to dismiss. There's also a second piece of this case that's interesting. The court was asked to analyze damages and profits and to limit what the plaintiffs could uh, discover on that issue. And so the second half of this case has a pretty, pretty good decision, pretty good language that goes through damages and profits in a copyright case um, and how monetary awards are viewed and calculated in copyright actions. It also affirmed the longstanding principle that punitive damages are not available in copyright cases. So this is an interesting read on a couple of reasons, for a couple of reasons, um, the motion to dismiss standards, the fair use factors, and also damages and profits. We can go to the next slide. Thank you, Kristen. So continuing the conversation with fair use, here we have another case, uh, this time dealing with fictional novels, uh, many of which I'm sure uh, we're all aware of, like Breakfast at Tiffany's, The Old Man in the Sea, On the Road, and 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, <clears throat> these books were repurposed and Moffitt Books uh, published a series of children's books called Kinder Guides, which were supposed to be educational uh, stories for, to help children ages six to eight um, with literacy. Um, these were essentially condensed, simplified versions of these popular <clears throat> classic novels, um, and they contain more or less the same themes, um, characters, though with different artwork and with <clears throat> some different concepts included. Uh, additionally, some educational materials towards the end of the guides. 
So the plaintiff, of course, claimed uh, infringement, both of their right of reproduction and their right to create a derivative work in the four novels. Uh, important to note is that they, uh, these novels currently did not have any children's uh, versions or published for any kind of audience. Um, you know, they were all facing uh, adult audiences. So Moffat's theory or argument was that these kinder guides are educational guides with all the adult, adult themes removed and that that is sufficient to transform it to a new creative work. Um, many of the facts in this case were largely undisputed and it included the fact that you know kinder guide essentially copied the original works um, I mean, verbatim and they prominently displayed the original titles of the work on the cover pages with Kinder Guide in smaller text uh, nearby, contained a few original pages of their own that I mentioned earlier. Um, but essentially, largely it was the it was, it was just an abridgment of the original works. Um, the parties also agreed that there was an established market that exists for children's books based on popular adult novels. Uh, Moffat books, in their defense, raised interesting arguments, claiming that the elements that they copied are not protectable, specifically that fictional facts, um, in other words, the characters and storylines within a novel are not protectable, um, which of course the court uh, uh, did not agree with. Um, they responded that <clears throat> the fact, made up facts about characters and events are protect, uh, protectable expressions under the law. Defendants went on to claim that their works were protected as educational guides because they had quizzes at the end and tests to check the assessment um, so make sure that the content was digested. Um, the, <clears throat> the court said that having a few pages towards the end of the guide, whereas 50 other pages therein are largely um, based on the original works, would not be sufficient to transform this to something more than copy. Uh, sub a subsequent work that basically recasts the original is a derivative work, and that's exactly what the court found. Um, on the matter of infringement, on every uh, factor, they found in favor of the plaintiff. Now, then the court looked at the fair use and whether defendants had some leg to stand on the four factors that Kristen introduced uh, earlier. Looking at the nature and purpose of the uh, nature, uh, the purpose and character of use, the <clears throat> this ruled in favor of the plaintiffs because, as mentioned earlier, the argument that abridgment of the stories, removal of adult themes, and additional analysis is transformative did not sway the court. Then moving on to the nature of the copyrighted work, fictional novel, novels are generally entitled strong protection under the Copyright Act. And this was also in favor of the plaintiff. Um, the amount and substantiality of the portion copyrighted was largely based on the original, and nearly all of the defendant's guides were devoted to retelling the plaintiff's copyrighted stories. They didn't add any different elements to the, these stories, uh, apart from coloring and some images, though so largely they were meant to depict the original characters. And finally, the effect upon the potential market for and value of the copyrighted work. Uh, this clearly affected the derivative rights that the original copyright holders had. Uh, it was interesting to note because the defendant also raised that the plaintiffs were not exercising these rights and that there is a public interest here that not allowing, not ruling in favor of the defendants uh, explicitly stifles creation of new works, um, which the court did not agree with because the fact that any given author has decided not to exploit certain rights does not mean that others can gain the right to exploit them. So a good takeaway from this is that even if a right is not being exercised, does not necessarily mean it's up for grabs. And an abridgment or just a summary of works uh, with little added to it would not be sufficient uh, to be protected. So moving on to the next case is going to be Nancy, who's going to be discussing another fair use case. 
And so um, in talking about this fun case of uh, regarding Dr. Seuss, it had the opposite outcome of the last case that Manu discussed where fair use did not apply. Most of us know the legendary tale of the Grinch that stole Christmas, and it's the story of a Grinch that lives in a cave at the top of Mount uh, Crumpets above Whoville, and the Grinch hated Christmas and came up with a plot to ruin Christmas for the Who's by stealing Christmas trees and presents. And during his crime spree, he ran into two-year-old Cindy Lou Who, who, you know, was woken up in the middle of the night um, by the Grinch stealing her tree. And she asked him, why are you stealing my tree? And he lied to her saying that he was going to fix the light on the tree and bring it back. And so Matthew Lombardo is a writer and he wanted to put a different spin on this story. So he authored a comedic play called uh, titled Who's Holiday, which tells the story of Cindy Lou Who, um, a foul mouth substance abusing widow. And so Lombardo's play gives you a glimpse of what Cindy Lou Who's life is like 20 years after her fateful encounter with the Grinch. And in the play, Cindy, uh, Cindy and the Grinch became friends and their relationship turned romantic when she turned 18. After learning that she became that she was pregnant with the Grinch's baby, they got married and moved into his cave at the top of Mount Crumpet. So a few years um, into their marriage, their relationship started to fall apart because they struggled with issues like unemployment, lack of access to health care, there was no heat, and they were hungry. Um, so one day when the, this married couple was getting into a scuffle, the Grinch fell off the edge of a cliff and died. Cindy was later arrested and imprisoned for the Grinch's death and their child was put into foster care. So basically Lombardo just wanted to make fun of the Dr. Seuss book, but Dr. Seuss did not find it too amusing. And um, Dr. Seuss felt that Lombardo's play was infringing upon its copyright and sent a couple of cease and desist letters. Lombardo filed a declaratory judgment action in federal court asking for a determination that his play was fair use, specifically a parody, and that it, he was just using another's copyright for criticism. Next slide, please. And as Chris, Kristen and Manu mentioned in the previous cases, there are four fair use factors to consider. And so the first one takes a look at how the work was used and whether there was any transformation in the work and a parody is considered transformative. And here the court found that Lombardo's play was a parody because it poked fun at the Grinch's utopian characterization of Whoville. And instead of being perfect and innocent, Lombardo's play casted Cindy Lou as a woman with drug and alcohol abuse issues and that she arguably murdered her husband. And the, so the court held that um, the play parodied the Grinch's characters and setting by adding something new and changing the original work with a new message. And so, you know, once it's determined that the work is a parody, it's unlikely that going through the rest of uh, the factors will sway it so dramatically that there will not be a finding of fair use, but we still need to go through the analysis anyways. And so taking a look at the second factor, whether the work is similar in nature, uh, the courts recognize that parodies necessarily have to copy the original work to some sense to parody it. And so in looking at factor two, this favored Dr. Seuss, but it was not given much weight by the court. Turning to the third factor, it looks at how much of the original work was used, whether it was excessive. And in this case, the court found that it was not excessive because while it included elements um, from the Grinch, such as the characters, the setting, the plot, um, Cindy Lou serves a completely different purpose from the original Grinch book, such that she was outlandish and profanity laden, where in the book she was just innocent and naive. And also, in the Grinch never appeared in the play, which takes place in a silver bullet trailer at the top of Mount Crumpet. And I definitely don't remember that there being the silver bullet trailer in the original Grinch. And unlike what Manu mentioned in the last case, the play did not quote or copy anything verbatim from the original um, Grinch book. And therefore the court found that the amount taken was reasonable. And so the last factor looks at the effect on the potential market. And here the court was highly skeptical that this play would affect whether it would divert sales from the original Grinch book or the movie. And in fact, the court thought that the play would increase the interest in 
the book in um, the original Grinch book. So in looking at these four factors, the court concluded that Lombardo's play was a parody and protected by fair use. But this saga is not yet over because Dr. Seuss appealed this fair use finding to the Second Circuit. So it'll be interesting to see how the Second Circuit comes down on this case later this year. And so I will throw it back to Manu. Thank you, Nancy. Just because we are running low on time, I'll quickly go through this one. Certainly feel free to reach out to us after if you want some further information. This case deals with compulsory licenses, which essentially <clears throat> grants the retransmission of a uh, copyrighted work that had originally been broadcast by someone else without having the secure consent of the copyright holder. This is typically applied for broadcast companies, and it was enacted as an exception specifically for them because uh, it would allow, it would avoid the burden of them having to get approval from every single copyright that they need to transmit out to the various geographic areas. And because they have certain fees that they can pay in place with the current technological changes that are coming about, uh, streaming services in particular also try to take advantage of this. Under the current definition, under the Copyright Act, uh, subsection 111, a cable system is currently the only system that's eligible for a compulsory license, which is what broadcast companies fall under. This case deals with whether internet retransmission services, such as services that rebroadcast online, stream, or pick up signals that are already in the airwaves, whether they're eligible to be categorized as cable systems, which um, as you can see is defined as very specifically as a facility whole in part, receives signals transmitted and licensed by the federal FCC and makes secondary transmissions. Ultimately, this case is interesting because both parties put down their plain meaning of, or their interpretation of the plain meaning of the text. Fox and the group companies put forth arguments that the plain meaning of the text requires a cable system to be all encompassing, meaning that every aspect of the transmission channel and the broadcast channel must be included uh, to be part of the system. However, the court didn't find this to be persuasive because nothing in the language explicitly says that the channels of broadcast or retransmission must be wholly owned by the, the service provider. This is particularly important in the internet context where the internet is vast and no one really owns the channels that it's just distributed through uh, versus the broadcast companies. On the flip side of the coin, we had the interpretation that uh, reading transmission is under a cable system. And if you look in the plain meaning of the uh, text, they do clearly fall under this definition, which is exactly what the courts agreed with. However, in this case, uh, what's important to note is that they defer judgment to the Copyright Office, which for several years has held that internet-based retransmission services do not qualify for compulsory licenses. Whether or not their cable systems is not you know, relevant to the inquiry. Um, and in, in fact, if this was decided by the court themselves, it's interesting, I wonder if they would have gone in favor of this alternate view. However, since deference was given to Copyright Office, they ultimately maintain the status quo and they would defer the interpretation and that there would be no changes in the case. All right, and uh, I think that's quick. We have a minute here. I'll uh, switch over to the next case. Thanks, Manu. All righty, so I'm really quickly going to talk about to highlight the points of these two um, circuit decisions by the Ninth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit regarding direct infringement and what is required. So here, um, these two circuit opinions reaffirms the fact that volitional conduct uh, for direct copyright infringement is alive and well. And when you think of volitional conduct, it's not the conduct as defined in the dictionary, which is the act of willing or choosing or the act of deciding. It's necessarily the link of proximate causation. And in both of these situations, um, the pl both plaintiffs were image owners that were suing service providers for uh, storing its images. And in both circumstances, both defendants were not directly liable for direct copyright infringement because it is the end users of the defendant that posted um, these plaintiff images on its website. So just keep in mind that volitional conduct is still required to prove a direct copyright infringement. 
And so we are done looking backwards towards notable cases from 2017, but we wanted to very quickly preview a few cases on our radar uh, for this coming year. And so the first trademark case that we we're going to be keeping an eye on is NantQuest versus Mattel, which is where the Fed Circuit will weigh in on whether applicants that appeal to the district court must pay the PTO bills, win or lose. And so the next case that we're watching is the Tiffany uh, versus Costco, which is where the Second Circuit will take a look at the nearly $20 million in damages that Costco was ordered to pay Tiffany for trademark infringement and counterfeiting. And so I'm going to switch it over to preview the rest of our trademark cases. As Nancy quickly said, these are just highlights for what's coming down the pipeline in, in 2018. Um, and I can skip some of the bullet points a little because we are well over the two o'clock mark. But Graham v. Prince, um, obviously, I had talked about that before. Um, that was an early motion to dismiss. And so there are bound to be additional motions in that case, including one for summary judgment. So we're going to be at the lookout for that. Uh, the case, uh, the case right above that in the copyright section, Lombardo v. Dr. Seuss. Obviously, Nancy just discussed that one. Bound to be additional um, motions and further decisions in that as well on appeal. Um, the BMG rights management case v. Cox. That's the third bullet in the copyright section. That one's quite interesting. Um, that is now on appeal in the Fourth Circuit, and it addresses the eligibility for DMCA safe harbor protection. Very, very, very important if you are an ISP these days. Uh, the district court had determined that Cox was barred from uh, invoking the safe harbor protections, and so that is up on appeal. Um, the main issue for that was Cox's failure to terminate repeat infringers. So whatever happens there remains to be seen. Um, but that's going to be an important decision regarding the DMCA and safe harbor. The next one, uh, for Fourth Estate Public v. Wall Street, another interesting case that's currently pending cert. Uh, it further highlights the circuit split regarding the proper interpretation of the registration requirement under the Section 411 of the Copyright Act. Some courts require an issued registration, while other courts require just a pending copyright application. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. The 11th Circuit had held that a party may not pursue an infringement suit until the Copyright Office has actually registered the work or refused to register. Uh, last case that we have our eye on is Fox News Network, the TVIs, another interesting one. Fox News had appealed a district court decision in New York holding that certain functions of a media monitoring service, which is what TVIs is, uh, that aggregated news reports and a searchable databases qualified as fair use. Very interesting opinion, very interesting fair use opinion that's quite comprehensive. That is up on appeal and we will see what happens with that. Um, but that's another interesting fair use decision coming out of the New York court. court. And that is essentially the end of the webinar. I know we are, after two o'clock Eastern, if anyone has, has questions, feel free to log them into the widget. Um, we want to thank everybody for attending. Those who need to drop off, please do so. You can replay the webinar. Um, you can get these slides. They're all going to be on our website. For those of you in New York and New Jersey, you can download and complete the CLE form. That is in the handout section of the widget. So make sure to look out for that. Um, once you complete it, you can send it back to us at FISH. Specifically, you want to send it to Lauren McGovern, which is M-C-G-O-V-E-R-N at fr.com. And as I said, if anyone's got questions, and I think that's it. So thank you, everybody, for attending. We really, really appreciate it. We had great attendance for this topic. We try and do it every year. So look out for us again in 2019.